In this video, we are going to be examining one of the most recognizable designs to emerge from Technical Readout 2750, and a mech with an almost perfect reputation among both players and mech warriors in the world of Battletech. This is a machine I've mentioned several times in other videos even, and this is just due to how noteworthy it is. While some mechs such as the Flashman are powerful, they don't carry with them the gravitas this does, as the battle mech can stand tall with other icons in the series such as the Marauder or the Warhammer, and can do so quite easily. So remarkable is this machine, it even has the first expansion pack for MechWarrior 4 named after it, which regardless of anything else, is quite the display for this armored giant. Of the mechs produced by Kong Interstellar at its height during the Star League, only one truly broke from the pack to become something beyond just noteworthy. And that mech is the Black Knight. A heavy mech weighing in at 75 tons, the Black Knight is much older than most of its more advanced peers, despite its reputation. First manufactured at the start of the Reunification Wars in 2578, the Black Knight was built to be a frontline combat mech as well as a heavy command unit. Despite its strong reputation, this machine in its primary configuration in fact uses very little loss tech and instead is just a well-balanced fighting machine, using what few advantages it has in these advanced technologies to make the most of it. And it was popular enough to even be the choice mount for a multitude of famous mech warriors, particularly from the Star League and the first years of the clans. Though others would arise from multiple eras outside of this as well. Likely the most famous is Elizabeth Hazen, one of the surviving Blackwatch mech warriors and the founding con of Clan Jade Falcon. Though another famous figure would be Reginald Van Joster and his Red Reaper, someone who would appear much closer to the Dark Age in time. The Black Knight was not born for a theoretical war that may emerge in the future, such as many of its 2750 counterparts. It was born in the cauldron of one of the most intense conflicts in human history, the Reunification Wars. The Knight was in fact manufactured only eight years into what would be the centuries-long political experiment that was the Star League. Unlike prior models, there isn't much that is mentioned in terms of its field trials or special quirks found by Kong, outside of its general purpose on the battlefield. With that said, its concept makes perfect sense for the era. Endo steel structure by this time had become a reliable technology and had few, if any, hidden drawbacks for development. Its Beagle Active Probe would also enhance its detection abilities beyond what most battle mechs had or would even have decades later. Outside of that, especially against the militaries of the periphery, there was little need to use experimental or extremely costly technologies on board. Instead, Kong focused on making the Black Knight a diverse, adept fighting machine, one which could outfight just about anything the periphery could dream of putting against it. It must have been a traumatic experience for the brave soldiers of the periphery to stumble across the Black Knight and other new or just more sophisticated vehicles during this era of warfare, which inevitably led to them being outfought and ground into dust. While the Black Knight isn't alone in this regard, the fact that the design was built and developed for the first time during the Reunification Wars themselves makes this an apt comment. Seeing this 75-ton giant moving at reasonable speed towards their lines, accepting brutal punishment and giving it back in turn, must have been distressing for those who suffered the Star League's wrath in its flagrant war of aggression. The Reunification Wars were a beyond bloody affair, and even with their inevitable capitulation to the Star League, even with friendly governments seemingly installed, there was always rumblings in the outer layers of the Star League, and calls for freedom. It would in fact, several hundred years later, be the periphery that would be the death blow to the Terran hegemony, the beating heart of the declining Star League, 
and the Black Knight would be there for all of that carnage as well. It's strange and perhaps ironic that House Cameron and its members often saw themselves as knightly or even noble in their appearance and demeanor, and embraced neo-feudalism to an extreme extent compared to their neighbors. It was there at the start, and it was there at their end, seeing the rise and fall of House Cameron in many senses as First Lords of the Star League as well. Amid this time, it would go from being a landed knight of this kingdom in space into being a knight with no nation for some time afterwards. Throughout this storied history all the same, the Black Knight would become the chariot for many gunslingers and for those who were in the SLDF Royal Divisions, the best of the best. It would face down house militaries in the Hidden Wars and in the chaos of the decline of the Star League before it would be seen as a part of the forces that would liberate the Terran people from the iron grip of the monster Stefan Ameris. It's almost hard to imagine, really, that people would be looking towards a Black Knight to liberate them from tyranny, but it seems to have been the case here. Though it's essential to note that the forces of the Rimworld's army in the Ameris Empire most definitely viewed the Black Knight in its more traditional role, that of a crusading beast Especially, I'm sure, after their first encounter with the Black Watch in the battle around Puget Sound. Despite its interesting appearance over the years from the core game and video game offshoots, the Black Knight has few additional features assigned to it. It's not particularly rugged or reliable, though it is not the inverse of either of those traits either. Its endurance in systems doesn't have a reflective point in game either. Instead, the series in its normal format, covering all variants barring experimental designs, come with the command mech trait for the advanced rules. This is conferred to the design not just from its reputation, but by virtue of its advanced onboard electronic systems, namely its Transcom Alpha communication system, though later, Post-Star League downgrades seem to migrate over to the Tech Battlecom system, but it doesn't matter, either way it carries the Command Mech trait. At the time of its construction, the Black Knight series battle computer and comm systems were considered to be state of the art, and allowed the battle mech not only to coordinate with its peers in units of varying sizes, taking on the role of a tactical commander, but also allows the Black Knight to network with other units across a planet, with potentially other commanders as well, as long as there are friendly satellites in system for it to communicate through. The communications array, as a result, is more than effective. The first configuration of the Black Knight built for the Star League, as well as its mainstream variant for the SLDF for the entirety of its history, is the BL-6-KNT Black Knight. Being a completely energy weapons dependent mech ensures it can operate almost indefinitely, unless it suffers a malfunction from wear or simply is damaged by enemy attacks. This would be the model that would be marching into the battlefields against the periphery nations and later Stefan Ameris' armies. In terms of distribution, it also would be the model that would become available to the Great Houses with time, but would not stay in most of their service forever, as the Succession Wars would eventually erode the ability to manufacture these, and would corrode their numbers until they were almost as much of a ghost as the Star League that commissioned them. They would see their resurrection eventually, decades after the discovery of the Hell Memory Core, and most famously, through Comstar. The 6KNT is not renowned for its raw speed by any means, and is meant to move at the speed of frontline formations during its introduction. To achieve this, it has a 19-ton VLR 300 Fusion Standard engine equipped, giving it a maximum speed of 64 kilometers per hour, or six movement points in the tabletop game. This performance is adequate for the role which the knight has, either engaging in battle line roles and engaging other heavy mechs, or operating as a local commander for such forces. This does mean it can be vulnerable to lighter or faster assets flanking it, but as a part of a broader formation this is less of an issue. It is neither fast nor slow. Where this 75-ton beast begins to run into some controversy in its traditional variant is the cooling system. Many Star League era mechs possess double heatsinks, which are more advanced, 
but have a higher cost in terms of their production value, and in some cases, simply aren't broadly available. In the case of the Black Knight, double heat sinks had only been invented 10 years prior to its construction in their prototype form, meaning that their availability was low. As a result, the 6KNT uses traditional heat sinks and invests 10 tons into them, giving it 20 sinking capacity overall. Despite this being a respectable total, and something which outstrips both the Marauder and the Warhammer, two other famous energy-dependent designs, the Black Knight cannot fire all of its primary weapon systems without overheating by six points. And that's provided it doesn't move. This means it must cycle its systems depending on what is most optimally going to hit, and what its heat situation is as of the moment it is choosing its weapons and targets. This lowers its overall efficiency as a result, unfortunately. The Black Knight can and does run hot when in the thick of the most dangerous fighting, most definitely, and must decide what systems to wisely utilize due to the limitations of its cooling system. While the Black Knight may not be able to fire its primary systems in a single devastating volley, at least not without suffering heat-related consequences, this does not mean that its offensive capabilities are by any means lacking. Its reputation is built not just on its durability and other features, but on its hard-hitting energy weapons. To start with, it comes with the ever-popular Magna Hellstar Particle Projector Cannon which is mounted in its right arm and is quite easily viewed as the large cannon attached to the back of this limb. This is the longest range weapon on the vehicle and can deliver devastating blows at long range as the Black Knight closes to a more ideal range, or it can be used to take pot shots at targets in support of other units. Once things begin to get into a more prime range, its most important weapons are a pair of McCorkle large lasers, with one mounted in each of its torsos. These two systems can be fired in unison at medium range without going over its heat limit, or can be half used with its PPC in order to not overheat as it engages its opposition. These can peel back armor all the same, and leave enemy mechs exposed to lighter fire or missiles from mechs attached to the Black Knight's formation. Or it can be used to soften up its prey before it engages them with its arsenal of secondary weapons, which are its four Maxell DT medium lasers. These lasers are common, but they do pack enough damage, especially collectively, to badly maul most of its enemies. Volleys of medium laser attacks are a more than valid tactic in this era of warfare, especially once targets are in its most ideal range, which is under 180 meters. It can fire all of its medium lasers and a single large laser without overheating at all, provided it doesn't move, or if it does walk, it will only acquire one extra point of heat for that round, which on its own will not hinder the Black Knight. The final weapon is its ultimate backup, which is its single magna small laser mounted in its head, meaning that should the Black Knight lose both of its torsos, but should its center torso and head be left intact, it can fight back, even if poorly, with this last laser of defiance. Outside of this comical system giving the Black Knight the ability to function much like its Monty Python namesake, it can be used in up-close engagements as well in an attempt to crit-seek enemy targets that get too close. All of these weapons together make the Black Knight a dangerous package, even if one that seems to be slightly too hot. Heat cycling different weapons is very much the norm during the Star League and Succession Wars, due to the lack of common double heat sinks packages. On another note, despite not being a true offensive system, the prime targeting and tracking on board is its 1.5 ton B Galactic Pro, which does help the Black Knight go above and beyond what normal battle mechs are capable of when tracking down targets and annihilating them. And this puts it to the head of the table for its time in this regard. Many heavy mechs will often pull armor in order to achieve better weapons loadouts or to allow themselves to run cooler. The Black Knight does not. To defend its internal frame, it has 13 tons of standard plating, providing it with 208 armor points. This means that the Black Knight is able to take a more than respectable amount of fire before it begins to be put into jeopardy, at least at the time of its introduction. 
Although it may not be the bleeding edge in terms of using sophisticated new weapons, or using advanced engines or heatsink systems, the BL-6-KNT is mostly just a well-put-together, hard-hitting heavy mech, which is more than able to square off against just about anything in the same weight bracket, especially at the time of its introduction. And that would be against other advanced machines for its time, let alone the forces it would see in opposition for the war it was built to fight against the periphery. Between its excellent range systems for its day, incredible durability, and its high endurance, it's no wonder this monster became so feared and garnered such a fantastic reputation among the pilots of the era and beyond. Many gunslingers would find themselves in the cockpit of a Black Knight, and later even Khans and Sakhans of the early clan era. There is little doubt it is because of Kong's excellent concept. Much later, it would be outcompeted by mechs such as the Flashman. But it's important to note that the Flashman costs literally 150% more than the Black Knight to produce. Can two Black Knights destroy a Flashman? Almost certainly. Meaning not only is this mech able to fight, and fight hard, it's not even particularly expensive for what it is, at least in its original configuration. Notwithstanding its age, there were no official modifications for the regular house forces or even the standard SLDF forces during the Star League, despite its early introduction. This would change though in regards to the royal divisions of the SLDF. An updated design was created especially for these units as they typically had much higher expectations and budgets for their formations, as they were meant to be kept as far ahead of any other force in the inner sphere as possible. Designated the BL-6B-KNT, the Royal would attempt to address the most common complaints with the Black Knight as compared to newer, more capable designs. First, it would install double heat sinks and contain 16 of these wonders, giving it 32 sinking capacity to mitigate the excessive loads of heat the design could generate, especially with its updated weapons package. Its large lasers were replaced by new pulse laser variants, reducing their range but increasing their damage and accuracy. And at long range, its Magna Hellstar PPC was upgraded to an ER PPC, giving it a longer reach to strike targets. The pulse lasers could be used in conjunction with its other onboard medium lasers with no heat issue now, meaning that this devastating heavy could potentially land 40 points of damage in a single laser-centric salvo, both blinding and melting anyone foolish enough to get in its way. These are small, simple upgrades, but truly elevate the Black Knight to the next level in terms of its performance, and this model would serve the Star League and its mech warriors well, as well as the eventual exiles of Kerensky's Exodus, where most of the royal variants would end up after the collapse of the Star League. The end of the Star League was more than traumatic for the Inner Sphere. It'd been waning for years, even prior to the apocalyptic Ameris Civil War, which destroyed the most advanced and powerful core of the Star League, the Terran Hegemony. The remaining House Lords themselves saw this as an opportunity to assert themselves and their own claims, both on one another, but also on the wreckage of the once great Terran state. The conclusion of all this, only just after what had been the worst war in the history of mankind up until this point, was the Succession Wars. A series of bloodlettings which resulted in something even worse. Hell was visited upon the Inner Sphere in the First and Second Succession Wars as the Great Houses maimed their fellows, and humanity was dragged back by centuries. Much of the most sophisticated technologies of the Inner Sphere were just lost. Life expectancies collapsed, and an era of darkness, violence, and carnage shrouded the Inner Sphere for over 250 years. During this time, the Black Knight would see action, at first in all forces. Only a few years into this new era of havoc and destruction, in 2802, Kong Interstellar's main factory on Connaught was destroyed. It would manage to restart for a decade, building downgraded models, before it was conclusively taken offline in a nightmarish assault from the Compelling Confederation, resulting in every Black Knight in the Inner Sphere becoming an unsupported battle mech. These legacy machines would continue to operate in an ever-dwindling number of units, until the Black Knight became a rarity in the Inner Sphere itself. 
Eventually, Kong would get back to the point where it could begin producing field downgrade kits, as well as replacement parts for those downgraded designs. But it would be centuries before Black Knights could ever walk from its factories once more. It would not even come back in real numbers outside of Comstar until the 3060s, decades after the effective end of the last major succession war conflict, the War of 3039. The Inner Sphere as a whole faced the same outcome largely. The ability to build jump ships dwindled, and battle mechs of dozens of types faded into the histories, some never to be seen again, and others only re-emerging after the discovery of long-lost data cores. The Black Knight would survive, but became an endangered, obscure battle mech, striding into battle with a commanding presence and mystique that few could match. To face down this legacy of a better time, for many mech warriors, would be unnerving to say the least, and in many cases, it would be their last battles. Ironically, in spite of being a higher number than the BL-6-KNT in order of model numbers, the BL-7-KNT is in fact the downgrade that would be seen most commonly amongst these dwindling vehicles in the Inner Sphere during the Succession Wars. The design does everything it can to keep continuity with the original six, but with the loss of the endo-steel internal structure technology and advanced electronics, this knight is a shadow of its former glory, though it is still potentially a very capable battle mech. As mentioned prior, much closer to the beginning of this video, it loses its original communications and targeting systems, and replaces them with the Tech Battlecom communications system and the Tech True Track targeting and tracking system. Both are downgrades of its prior electronic utilities, though it maintains its special quirk and attributes in the advanced rules despite this. It maintains almost all of its original weapons package, though it does change the brand of several systems such as switching most of their lasers over to Tronel brand systems. With the tonnage saved from not having its Beagle Active Probe, the 7-KNT still needs two tons to meet its weight requirement, and given Kong kept its weapons intact, this means that it must come from either the heat sinks on board or from its armored protection. It might have been wise to split the difference even, but the choice was made to remove two tons of armor from the BL-7-KNT in order to make the design work, making it less armored than a Marauder, but almost as dangerous if not just as dangerous in most other respects. The 7-KNT is a capable design, and one which doesn't suffer as badly as some other designs for being less armored just because it has no ammunition on board to explode catastrophically. It is more protected than a Warhammer, and it can still perform in frontline combat duties, though it must be more careful about the fights and opponents it picks when it has a choice in the matter. Still, a rare design for the era, it would only be seen in limited numbers, and by the 31st century was an exceptionally rare sight to see on the battlefield, just due to the lack of machines being produced for 200 years by this point. When this 75-ton warrior appears, only the hardest of battle mechs and mech warriors can afford to stare it down. A diminished knight is still a knight. Before we depart the Succession Wars altogether, the 7 Series Knight has a cousin from the Free Worlds League, most notably the BL-7-KNT-L. This model was introduced due to limited amounts of PPCs being procured in the League, and replaces its PPC with a third large laser. This has been done with multiple other designs in the League, including the Marauder. With the saved weight, the L puts two more tons into its heat sinks, giving it 22 sinking capacity, which is almost enough to let it fire all three of its large lasers without penalty, but not quite. Still, this means it can afford to fire all three of its large lasers on one turn, and then simply switching to firing two large lasers on the next, and it would remain heat neutral doing so. For the era of the Succession Wars, this is far from a bad compromise. As a mid-range fighter, this might even outdo the normal 7 KNT. Alexander Kerensky saw what would become of the Inner Sphere. 
It was a sad reality for a man who'd spent his whole life in service of what he believed was the greater good of the sphere itself, the Star League. With its chaotic collapse, multiple important individuals inside of the wreckage of Terran space had asked him to attempt to take on the title of First Lord, or even to become the Director General of the ruins of what had been the Empire McKenna had built. He saw no way to protect this badly savaged portion of space, especially with so many former officials killed by Ameris, or killed in the liberation of the state. The end of the Star League was here, and nothing could stop what was to come. His own forces had been depleted, and even if he could fight one, or perhaps two houses, he could not fight five. And he certainly couldn't do it while controlling what was the husk of a state with almost no remaining industrial potential and badly depleted human resources. So much had been lost in the war, both materially and on the human level, he saw no hope for his home. If he stayed, even if he didn't become the Director General, he knew his forces would fragment along house lines, or would fight until their own exhaustion and destruction. This was the worst case scenario even, because it would extract an even bloodier toll on the Inner Sphere, because Kerensky knew what few wanted to accept. The war was coming, and one even worse than the hell they'd just experienced. It was already started by the time he left, even if it was being done silently. The Inner Sphere would be turned into a mass graveyard, and there was nothing he could do to help outside of leave. With him, the majority of the SLDF took flight, taking their ships and mechs. Into the darkness they would go, and in more ways than just one. The Black Knight would be prevalent among the machines taken with them, even. And many noteworthy pilots and gunslingers, as mentioned before, brought their knights with them on this perilous journey. Because in this exodus, there was no peace. Even so far away from the Inner Sphere, there was only more war and hardship. From there, these people would transform from Alexander Kerensky's Star League Defense Forces into Nicholas Kerensky's clans. The Black Knight would see service in the first to final battles of the Pentagon Wars on both sides, but more so on the rising power of the clan side. After the subjugation of so many people to their new masters, the Black Knight would see battle in clan trials, and eventually the destruction of Clan Wolverine, participating in both sides of the conflict as before. Even once the clans made their return to the Inner Sphere, rear line units may have found themselves occasionally handed this ancient war machine. Despite being viewed as a mech of the Inner Sphere, it has its legacy with the clans as well. The Inner Sphere seemed to be on the brink of a new, catastrophic war when the clans returned to the Inner Sphere to enforce their peace upon it. Along the entire north of the Inner Sphere, these powerful invaders struck like lightning, hitting the Draconis Combine, Federated Commonwealth, Free Rosselhig Republic, and Oberon Confederation in a series of brutal attacks, driving straight towards the very core of the Inner Sphere and the very birthplace of mankind the former capital of the Star League, Terra. The clans had a prophecy to fulfill, and all who stood before them would be crushed and thrown into the wind, until their goal was finally within their grasp. Only the clans were not the only descendants of the Star League. Terra was run by the remnants of what had been the last administrators of the Terran hegemony and Star League after General Alexander Kerensky made his exit from the Inner Sphere. Jerome Blake would turn this one-planet government into a company, and would hatch a plan for it to survive the ages by turning that into a religion. A religion with its own prophecies, and its own dogmas, as well as unintentionally its own darker side. Comstar itself held vast storage facilities filled with war machines, including mechs such as the Black Knight. When the clans fought their Inner Sphere counterparts, they had been fighting house forces, mercenaries, or any assortment of lower quality troops, as well as almost all of these being relatively poorly equipped. During all of this, a game of intrigue would be played, which resulted in the Battle of Tukiad, 
where Comstar and its Comguard would square off against the clans in a battle for who would control Terra. In 3052, it would be Comstar who would win this engagement, decisively, with its army of well-trained, well-equipped soldiers, often carrying with them the very equipment that the Star League Defense Forces once did centuries earlier, preserved for an emergency such as this. In no small part was it possible because of mechs which I've highlighted so far, such as the Highlander and King Crab. But there is another more than famous battle mech that would be given the title of Clan Buster for a unique design seen from the Comguards. And that would be the Black Knight. The Comguard would possess in reasonable numbers the normal configuration of Black Knight, as well as a handful of royal variants which they had managed to keep in their inventory. The BL-6-KNT would see service in the battlefields of Tukiad and beyond, but there would be another, newer variant, designed with input from Frederick Steiner, which would emerge as a looming, destructive, seemingly dishonorable to the clan forces battle mech. Arguably one of the most dangerous heavy mechs designed during this era, the BL-9-KNT was built to do one thing. Destroy clan battle mechs, and do so in close quarters engagements if possible. This would be distinguished by being nicknamed a quote, clan buster, unquote, variant. The 9KNT maintains its endosteel frame and continues to benefit from the weight savings it provides. In order to make more room for weapon systems in terms of its weight, it installs a 300XL, replacing its old 300 standard. More than fortunately, thanks to the advanced technology, it reduces its heatsink investment to a mere 5 tons, but makes these double heatsinks, giving it 30 sinking capacity overall. All of these changes free up almost 15 tons of additional space. Meanwhile, it maintains its original complement of armor, which is 13 tons of standard plating. The knight also removes its Beagle Active Probe, as it's no longer fit for purpose in the kinds of battles that the Clan Buster is expected to engage in. Its electronic systems on board, however, are not mistreated, as with the 7KNT downgrade. Its communications array is still the superb, original Transcom Alpha system, and its targeting computer is the reliable Dalban Hi-Res system. The real ferocity of the Clan Buster begins and ends with its offensive capabilities. Instead of mostly opting for standard lasers, it would be engineered into a pulse laser platform with much of its saved wit. To begin with, it has an Aberdovi large pulse laser in its center torso, which is an accurate, hard-hitting weapon. To back this up, it then has four Aberdovi medium pulse lasers, with one mounted in each arm and one mounted in each side torso. These five pulse lasers combine into a horrifying force, despite their close range. When at its ideal distance, the 9KNT can deliver a series of accurate, hard-hitting blows that will even make their clan opposition think twice before engaging. But the only problem is, prior to Tukiad, the clans never fought a Black Knight such as this. There was no prior warning to what they would face. Interestingly, Comstar determined that mechs with hatchets had done unexpectedly well against clan assets, and as a result, opted to give a hatchet to this close-range clan killer. The outcome is a utility which only enhances the pulse weapons on board. Able to strike firmly and accurately before engaging in direct melee combat, the 9KNT can shred its already weakened enemies after coming in for its melee strikes, something which most clan pilots are unaccustomed to, and what's worse, this brutal, primitive hatchet provides the Black Knight with the force necessary to crush or cut through a cockpit with a single swing, should it land on that most vulnerable of positions. Even if it doesn't find its home buried in an enemy head, it lands with the full force and impact of a Gauss rifle. While all of this close-range fire sounds fantastic, and it has most of the heat sinks on board to manage it, one might think that the Clan Buster has no real ability to defend itself at range. They would be wrong. This Black Knight is still fitted with a Magna Sunspot Extended Range Particle Projection Cannon in its right arm, and has a pair of McCorkle large lasers, with them being mounted in the left and right torsos respectively, 
These weapons mean that the knight can decide between deploying its long-range systems as it prepares to close in, and can convert over to its shorter range systems as it reaches the more ideal range for them. And it shouldn't be breaking its heat barriers excessively while doing it, unless the situation is particularly dire. An alpha strike from this titan would be a core melting 57 points of heat. There are few circumstances where this could be considered worth the risk. Comstar created a monster by observing what the clans hated to face the most, and placed it into a single, well-designed machine, and attempted to mask its weakness by emboldening its strengths. While capable at medium and long ranges, this close-range headhunter is an immense threat, far beyond a normal Black Knight, as soon as it comes within 10 hexes of its intended target. Within 6 hexes, it becomes something terrifying to anyone knowing what is coming, which the clans unfortunately didn't. At the conclusion of these layers of despair, at point-blank range, almost any clan mech warrior on the grounds of Tukiad or the rest of the clan invasion will be engaging in the struggle of their vat-born life as they face a remorseless revenant with no regard for their art of battle. It will scorch, cut, and pulverize its clan adversary, potentially even heavier clan mechs, until they are sent to the ground smoldering and broken before striding to its next victim. The only drawback this incredible battle mech has is that its XL engine can make it vulnerable to torso loss. That's all though. Beyond this, this is Fox Nightmare unleashed for the clans, and it is a nightmare many clan warriors would never wake up from. The Black Knight is more than an apt name and appearance for this horror. The clan invasion would end with the Inner Sphere winning this initial engagement against the clan invaders, and eventually culminated with the destruction of Clan Smoke Jaguar, and a peace that mostly lasted between the major Inner Sphere powers and the clans until the Dark Ages. But during the clan defeat, an unfortunate turn of events would take place, at least for the citizens of House Steiner Davian, the Federated Commonwealth. Catherine Steiner Davian, or Katrina Steiner as she would later wish to be known, would seize the Lyran half of the Federated Commonwealth amidst the Free Worlds League and Capellan Confederation's attack on what would become the Chaos March, splitting the Federated Commonwealth in two, both in terms of its borders and political systems. She would declare herself Archon of the new Lyran Alliance. This would escalate as politics became more chaotic, and after the assassination of Arthur Steiner Davian in the Cothiel Incident, a true war would spark off, leading to a hopeless, catastrophic campaign that would eventually see Katrina removed from power, but only after countless people lay dead, and whole worlds were left in ruins on both sides of this once mighty empire. Worse, the wars were so grievous, it resulted in the collapse of the new Star League, which then turned into the next horror to be unleashed on the Inner Sphere. Traditionally, the Black Knight was neither a Steiner or Davian mech, and found its home almost entirely within Comstar, and to a much lesser extent, its downgrade saw additional usage in the Free Worlds League just due to its proximity to Khan's limited facilities but the 7KNT was still mostly scattered across the Inner Sphere. This would change in 3063, when Robinson's standard battleworks would pursue and secure a production license from Kong Interstellar to begin production of its own Black Knights. This was a heavy investment by the Federated Sun-centric manufacturer, but it paid off, and a new, popular upgrade for the Black Knight would appear, the BL-12-KNT which had a radically different approach to the Comstar variant of this venerable machine. This would be the most recent official model of the knight to appear until the Dark Age era. It's also interesting to note that the success of this mech from the day of its production resulted in Kong Interstellar investing once more in resurrecting its Black Knight program, and two years later, their own steel behemoths would begin walking out of the factory gates, with hungry buyers awaiting each and every one. 
The Federated Commonwealth Civil War may have been a horrible nightmare for countless millions, if not billions, but it could be good for business. Robinson's designs differed wildly from the Clan Buster, looking more to make the Black Knight a mid-range shootist than a close-range brawler, and would aim for it also to be more durable, not following Comstar's path of installing an Inner Sphere XL engine into the mech. Much of the internal systems resemble the original 6KNT, with it having the same endosteel frame, 300 standard engine, and 13 tons of armor plating. It does take the route of installing the far more sophisticated double heatsinks cooling system, and has 16 of these devices installed, giving a cooling ability of 32, matching the original Royal design. Also, the 12 possesses one new technology in particular, at least for its time, which is an advanced targeting computer and invests it with so many tasks that it weighs 6 tons in the mech. This allows the 12KNT to better network its weapons and fire more accurately at targets. A constant between many Black Knights, this mech maintains its twin large lasers, giving it a reasonable punch at medium range, but these would now be backed up almost by the rest of the systems on board. Despite having a slightly shorter range, the new ER medium lasers are also attached which replace its traditional medium lasers, offering a more than reasonable backup to these larger weapons, and can work in unison with these large lasers quite well, so long as the mech doesn't allow itself to overheat too much while using them in conjunction with one another. For long range ability, it once more relies on an ER PPC, and this too can be used jointly with its large lasers at medium range if the knight wishes to be more concentrated in its damage, rather than scattering damage across an enemy frame. With all of these systems working in unison with its targeting computer, it can lay down accurate fire on adversaries at this medium range area, as well as making far more targeted strikes in close should the battle come into its shorter range. While not a true clan buster like the Comstar variant, it is a superb mid-range direct fire mech, and when networking with a competently designed force, it can provide the support or direct fights required to see its side through to victory. This would be the Black Knight that would line up with the Federated Sons portion of the Federated Commonwealth during the messy, violent breakup of the Commonwealth. The looming knight marched in formation under the banner of House Davian earning it an incredible reputation and a home within the Federated Sons, and later with their ally, the Republic of the Sphere. The bleakest assault on the Inner Sphere as a consequence of the collapse of the Second Star League was a tragedy on such a scale and caused such turmoil that after the destruction of the Word of Blake and the recapture of Terra, a new state would be allowed to form in the heart of the Inner Sphere. This restored Terran state, named the Republic of the Sphere, would be headed by one Devlin Stone, who would help with the reconstruction of worlds badly mauled during decades of warfare. And the Republic would become, in many senses, the restored beating heart of the Inner Sphere that died when Stefan Amaris destroyed much of it in his vicious contesting of the SLDF. The Republic would unironically create a title for their best warriors, that being Knight of the Sphere, for those who'd proved themselves in battle. And they were in some senses the spiritual successors to Thomas Hallis' Knights of the Inner Sphere. A fitting name, given one of the mechs that would be boldly represented in the Republic of the Sphere, and would be prominent, was in fact the Black Knight. Connaught, the primary world which Kong Interstellar operated from, was in the Free Worlds League up until the breakup of the state, as the after-effect of the Blakest Era and from the shattering of trust as a consequence of the deception behind Thomas Hallis being a fake, as well as the maddened plots of the true Thomas Merrick. It would fall into the hands of the newly reborn Republic of the Sphere, and with it came the ability to build and domestically produce the Black Knight, as well as a volume of other newer designs using cutting-edge technology. Some of these variants even artistically take on a new look as of MechWarrior Dark Age, and eventually these would bleed over into the 3145 designs. Though there is a new redesign of the Black Knight arriving as of the Clan Invasion Kickstarter, some of these may slowly begin to fade into the background. 
All the same, there would be a deluge of designs that would be built and deployed by the Republic of the Sphere. It's interesting to add that the Republic was generally allied with House Davian, despite Davian seemingly funding insurgents inside of its borders, and would share many of its designs with its ally, resulting in the new Black Knights also being mostly produced for the Federated Sons as well from their own facilities on Robinson. Many of the more Republic-centric designs of the Black Knight were a radical divergence from what had come in the past. Its departure would come in the form of how the mech functions as movement and protection are huge indicators as to how a machine can and should be used. It also ends up using an abundance of clan level technology for its weapon systems, giving it a terrifying function on the battlefield. Despite using a similar class of engine as its predecessor, a 14-ton VLAR 300 light fusion engine, the maximum speed of this particular variant is only 54 kilometers per hour. This is, for a heavy mech, frankly, slow. And it is related to one of its defensive systems, namely its medium shield. This changes the role of the Black Knight to be something closer to a more traditional assault mech, and as a consequence, it would have to be deployed as a slower moving asset of a unit, or it would have to be a part of a breakthrough or assault formation, as it doesn't have the mobility to operate inside of a normal strategic battle line unit. With a full energy design, and one that can use clan systems, the 5H needs an extensive amount of heat dissipation. And while it doesn't have everything it might need, it is well served by its 17 double heat sinks, giving it a 34 heat dissipation ability. To be as heavily armed with such a diverse array of weapons, especially of clan quality, is uncommon for any spheroid mech, and this helps this new generation of Black Knight stand apart from its peers. First, it has the terrifying, head-clipping weapon known as a Clan ER PPC, also known as a Type DDS Kingstar Extended Range Particle Projector Cannon. It is in every way an upgrade over its preceding design's cannon, and landing a devastating 15 damage blow, making it a head-clipper against almost any mech in the game. To further add to this deadly energy assault, and its longest range weapons now, it has a pair of Exostar Pinnacle Clantech extended range large lasers, which hit as hard as standard PPCs, and go a similar distance to the extremely long-reaching AC2 autocannon. Unlike previous designs, these are mounted in the arms, not its torso. Another paired set of lasers is its Exostar Pinnacle Clantech Extended Range Medium Lasers, which do almost as much damage as the first Black Knight's large lasers, and go just as far. These one-ton devils are installed into its side torsos. As you can probably assume, there is another pair of lasers, this time a pair of Exostar Pinnacle Clantech Extended Range Small Lasers. These don't have an immense range, they hit as hard as traditional medium lasers, and one is inserted into each of its arms. Finally, to cap off this list of Technicolor Death Rays, is a pair of side torso mounted Exostar Pinnacle Clantex Small Pulse Lasers. Pulse lasers are more accurate and do more damage, but in this instance, they are also an effective system against both infantry and battle armor, giving the Black Knight a multitude of options in close against a diverse number of targets when choosing its relevant weapons. All of these offensive capabilities come together as the original Black Knight does in many ways, offering up offensive options at every range but becoming a beautiful series of threat lines for its own defense as well. Each layer its opponents come closer into becomes an additional layer of hell for them to weather, so even when counterattacking such a monster, it is like running into a phalanx of energy-based destruction. This iteration of the Black Knight is superbly protected by 13.5 tons of standard plating, giving it 216 armor points. It also uses a shield, which I mentioned earlier, something which can be used to reduce damage. Though it can itself be destroyed over time, but it is an active additional barrier of defense that the knight might be able to rely on under the right conditions. In fact, the designers bet on it, given their willingness to sacrifice 10 kilometers per hour of movement for this machine. The BL-NT-5H resembles more of an assault mech than it does a heavy, and is a very large break from its ancestor as a result. While it's armed in a similar way, only with more advanced technology and systems, its slower movement and higher defense makes it into somewhat of a pocket assault mech. It is a devastating weapon of war, and served the Republic well for the years it was there. 
but even with its mech warrior's eyes on it, the Republic is no more, and many of these knights fell in its defense. But while one dream may be extinguished, there is yet more to see. It would be Alaric Ward and Clan Wolf that would climb highest atop the mountain of corpses to fulfill the dream of becoming the Ill Clan of the Clans, with Ward being made the Ill Con of the Ill Clan. Clan Jade Falcon would also reach for this achievement, and would be nearly annihilated and turned into little more than a puppet of Clan Wolf in the event, which is more than ironic given the two clans' past and history. The Fallen Republic would be crushed underfoot, and what had been left was being conquered and digested by the Wolf Empire and Capelling Confederation. Interestingly, portions of the Dying Republic would find themselves in desperate need of protection, and worlds would be both annexed by force or offered sanctuary by the Free Worlds League, including its traditional territory of Connaught. Where one knight fell, another would rise as part of the Restored League which now finds itself in a life-or-death struggle with the Wolf Empire that maimed it by annexing the Merrick Stewart Commonwealth for itself many years prior. Alaric Ward painfully is also responsible for the deaths of multiple important heads of state in the League, having both killed the Warden General of the Free Worlds League, Thaddeus Merrick, and being responsible in many ways for the Captain General of the Merrick Stewart Commonwealth, Anson Merrick's end as well. With this new war unfolding, production of the Black Knight and its latest variants would fall into the hands of the League, as these 75-ton giants stride to war for their traditional, restored masters. Kong Interstellar's latest Colossus is one which served the Republic prior to serving the League, and examples can also be found in the Capellan Confederation due to them annexing large amounts of Republic equipment and territories. The model is designated as the BL-18-KNT. This beast follows its other contemporaries in terms of using clan technologies, but takes on its traditional appearance, while lacking the additional protection of the shield its sibling designs have. Running a light 300 fusion engine to save weight while not exposing the Black Knight to as much of an issue as with traditional Intersphere XL engines, it's well served and once again can march at 64 km per hour, keeping up with its normal battle line formations. Using the saved weight from the lack of a shield, it installs more double heatsinks, and unlike many of its mixed tech counterparts, it uses clan tech level double heatsinks each one taking up less of a critical footprint inside the machine. This gives the knight a total of 20 double heat sinks, which allows it to sink 40 heat, which is astonishing. For defense, it has its original complement of 13 tons of standard armor. To finish this list of components, for targeting and tracking, it uses both a Beagle Active Probe and a targeting computer, combining both advanced systems from the 6KNT and the 12KNT. In many ways, the 18KNT is an upgrade of the original design, and mixing elements from the 12KNT, as well as also using clan technology. Much like its contemporary variants, it uses a clan ER PPC which is installed into its right arm. It then combines this with a pair of torso-mounted clan ER large lasers, with one in each of its side torsos. One clan ER medium laser then backs this up in each of its torsos again, and one more can be found in each of its arms. Finally, there is a clan small pulse laser installed into the head. These function all together, much like the 6 or 12 night variants did, only with better cooling and better damage due to the expansion in its sinking capacity and newer, deadlier clan weapon systems. The once clan buster evidently became the clan adopter, at least in this respect. With its target and computer boosting its ability to hit, this mech hits like a freight train. At 15 hexes, provided all of its weapons hit, the 18 KNT would deal a staggering 63 points of damage on an Alpha Strike, though it would radically overheat doing so. Much like the original with which it was heavily based, the 18 must swap weapons depending on the range it's fighting at, but it will, as long as it wisely uses its systems, hit hard every turn, and importantly, 
accurately until its opponents are turned into slag. Well suited in a commander frontline role, this mech does as it always has in these respects, making itself an excellent tactical asset for any mech commander. These are the Knights of the Free Worlds League, and more so than the fake Merrick Thomas Hallis's knights ever could have hoped to have been. Without knowing it at the time, when this mech was crafted in the 26th century, it would be bound for greatness. Mech warriors for centuries have used this as their mount of choice, from gunslingers, to clan warriors, to comm guard soldiers, to the knights of the inner sphere, to the knights of the sphere, and now once more to the foot soldiers of the Free Worlds League and the desperate armed forces of the Federated Sons. The Black Knight has always demonstrated that it is a tough, reliable machine, with incredible endurance and a vicious ability to put fire on its targets. Its appearance as a knightly figure helps it intimidate its opponents upon its sight as well. A true juggernaut of the Inner Sphere, its reign has lasted for six centuries, and will seemingly last for more decades or centuries yet. It is in many ways the embodiment of what a heavy battle mech often should be. Its pilots, one hopes, are what mech warriors themselves should be, fighting for their cause, and fighting as hard as they can in order to achieve something great. None shall pass their reputation so long as they pilot a Black Knight. Well, this video took longer than expected. You can't do something like a video like this without having some attachment to the mech, and I've always appreciated the Black Knight, and have loved the redesign it's gotten from Catalyst Game Labs. While I didn't want to go into too many individual stories, I really did want to convey where it had been. This machine was born in war, and has traveled with Battletech through so many major areas it's incredible. It's easily one of my favorite mechs, and I was really happy to share this with all of you. But with that, thank you for joining me here today. If you enjoyed this video, I'd really appreciate a like on this video for all of the work that went into it. If you're wanting more content, have you considered subscribing to the channel? I put new Battletech content up as frequently as I can. And finally, if you want to support this channel further, there is a join button in the video that would allow you to become a YouTube member to this channel. Members help make sure I have the leeway to work on productions like this video, and I greatly appreciate every single YouTube member, because as I've said before, this is only possible because of viewers like you. With all of that said, I look forward to seeing what you all have to say in the comment section below.